So today I'm continuing the series of talks on the Noble Eightfold Path. Does, does anybody know where we're up to? Right effort. Right effort. That's that's it. Number six. So very good. So there's only two more after this, and I I think that's exactly the number of talks I'll be giving another two after this. So it will fit. I would like to have done one on right livelihood. Right livelihood is of course how we work, and uh, it's a good percentage of our time, you know, if we're working, it takes up quite a lot of the day. And this is a very important area for, uh, for us, you know, when we're practicing. Because the practice, of course, is not only when we come to the temple and do the chanting, take the precepts, it's when we go into the testing ground, <laughs> when, we go, when we're actually playing the match, as it were. And that's at home, that's at work, and the rest of the time. So today I was going to first mention another quote. I'd like to start uh, each of the factors with a quotation from the Buddha about the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is uh, one from the, another one from the Dhammapada, they're all from the Dhammapada. And he says, this is the only path, or direct path, sometimes people translate it. There is none other for the purification of insight. Tread this path and you will bewilder Mara. Mara is, of course, the negative qualities within ourselves, uh, and we will overcome those negative qualities. So, as we mentioned, this is the uh, sixth factor, and I was using the symbol of a Dhamma wheel, and the Dhamma wheel usually has eight spokes for the Noble Eightfold Path, and this is the sixth spoke from the Noble Eightfold Path. And this group, you know, from now from Sama Wayama, this is uh, right effort, right up to Sama Sati, Sama Samadhi, people are very interested in this side. <laughs> Usually very interested in the other sides, except for uh, uh, Sama Jiti, right view. Mostly people don't pay that much attention. But in actual fact, the more I uh, contemplate the Noble Eightfold Path, the more I practice it, I realize how each, each of the factors is actually absolutely necessary. They're not uh, dispensable. And yesterday we had a question about, you know, what we should we practice? Should we focus on giving? Should we focus on uh, our ethical behavior? Should we focus on uh, bhavana? And of course, you know, it's a total package, a complete package. So we have to uh, take all those things into account uh, because they affect our lives and the way we live. And in very real sense, the uh, right effort, or I like uh, Bhante Ji calls it, uh, do you know Bhante Bunaratana? He used to come here, but he's now very elderly, so he's not traveling very much. He lives, he's a Sri Lankan monk who lives in America, and he's written a very nice book called Eight Mindful Steps to Happiness, which is about the Noble Eightfold Path. And uh, so uh, the, essence, uh, the essence of the teachings um, you know, is is this skillful quality that Bhante, Bhante Chi is using. He's, he uses skillful effort, not right effort. <laughs> However, I always like to point out, you know, skillful effort's quite good, but it doesn't work so well for the other factors, I don't think, because I say they're right, because, of course, most people say, well, how can you say this is right effort and this is right uh, mindfulness, right samadhi, and so on. And I always say, right for enlightenment, to reach enlightenment, right for awakening, in that sense. These will lead that way. Of course, one can, uh, you know, have other sorts of effort that won't lead to, um, or won't lead to awakening, won't lead to enlightenment. And of course, there are many types of effort that we have. We have to use during the day. When we study to, uh, in order to, uh, you know, complete a course, learn, we're putting in effort and we get qualifications and we're always putting in effort, different sorts of effort. But what the Buddha is concerned with, of course, is developing effort that leads to enlightenment, leads to awakening. The other sorts of effort, they're very useful and very pragmatic, aren't they? We need them, absolutely need them. But they won't necessarily lead us to the end of suffering, to the highest happiness. And so the essence of the Buddha's teaching is really uh, Samawayama, this uh, right effort or skillful effort, which is the abandoning, the giving up of the unwholesome and the developing and the maintaining, perfecting of the wholesome. So this is letting go of negative qualities and developing positive qualities. That's the essence of the whole of the Buddha's teaching. 
And I think many people will know this quote. Sambhapapasa akaranam kusalasa upasampada sachita pariyoda panang etang buddhana sasanang. Most people, many people know that. Very important teacher, the teaching, the Awada Patimoka. And it means, you'll, you'll, you'll soon see how it relates to the talk today, not to do any bad, to cultivate the good, to purify one's mind. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. So this is the essence of giving up, not doing uh, the unwholesome, the negative, either by body, speech or mind, and to do the positive, you know, either by body, speech or mind, and to purify the mind. This is where we, we say mental cultivation, bhavana, which is a very big part of that is meditation. And that is the reconditioning of the mind because we have many, you know, we conditioned our minds in, in many ways, and some of them very are negative, and we experience those in our lives. So, in other words, we, when we recondition the mind with uh, meditation, a good example is if we recondition with metta, loving kindness, we can reduce anger, ill will, annoyance, irritation, and all those things. And uh, the essence, of course, of uh, right effort or skillful effort is energy and this is virya in uh, Pali, the Pali language and the effort, energy, energy leading to effort can be of course wholesome or unwholesome and I think most of you and myself included can see plenty of cases, plenty of illustrations of unwholesome effort you know when we have wars and uh, when we have uh, violence in society when we're breaking any of the five precepts, we can see unwholesome effort, can't we? When there's lying, stealing, sexual misconduct, all those sorts of things. This is unwholesome uh, effort coming from an unwholesome energy. But as I mentioned, we do need effort in our lives. And if you see, uh, if you look at the Buddha's teaching, it, the sense of effort, of striving, um, uh, developing, is very, very strong. It's a very important factor in the Buddha's teaching. But of course, we have to do, develop effort or energy in the right way. Um, all of us are usually very good in, in the sense of developing effort into doing. <laughs> this is our main, main preoccupation, isn't it, as human beings. We, we do a lot, and a lot of our thinking is about what we're going to do in the future, what we did in the past. And, and this is very much where most of our effort goes into it, into doing. And this is very useful for everyday life, isn't it? For coping with what we have to do, going to work and uh, living with a family. And there are many things we have to do. So, of course, the doing part of the mind is quite well developed. <laughs> We're pretty good in that area. Uh, but what does meditation focus on? It's the knowing part of the mind. It's a different, the doing part of the mind is a very active part of the mind. It's our reaction to what we're experiencing, you know, to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching and thinking. But the knowing part of the mind is that part of the mind which is stepping back, which is passive, which is knowing what's going on in the present moment. That's mindfulness, isn't it? The present moment. Knowing what we're seeing, seeing hearing, smelling, tasting, touching and thinking in the present moment. And this side of our development is actually lacking. And this is where meditation is, it helps us to redress the balance. Because to a large extent, if we, uh, with, with the, the knowing part of the mind, it obscure, the uh, doing part of the mind obscures the knowing part of the mind. So we're not very sensitive to it. We're not very aware. We're not very present in many ways. And part of that doing, of course, is thinking, isn't it? Because thinking is a very is a big agent for, for, our, for our doing. And so with meditation, developing the knowing, we're reducing the thinking, we're reducing the doing uh, until we know the mind much, much more clearly. We know what we're experiencing without uh, the, uh, we say, obscuration, without the... the uh, without it being covered up by our doing, covered up by our thinking. So it's very, very important that we go in that direction. So our main effort in, in uh, Sama Wayama, in skillful effort, is to develop this knowing, to develop the knowing. Because if we develop the knowing, if we are present and we know what's really happening, 
Then we have the data for insight. Then we have the information we need to come to uh, uh, an understanding of reality. Usually, most of us, our idea, we, what we usually focus on is our thinking. We think about the world and we, we think about insight. And many people can read books on the different insight knowledges and they can come out with these. But this is not insight, this is thinking. <laughs> it's not direct experience. And of course, this is what the Buddha is talking about, direct experience because we have to know for ourselves. We can't just uh, take the Buddha's wisdom, his insights, his understanding, and claim them for ourselves. They're a very good indicator where we need to look, how we need to look, what we need to look at. But they're not ours. They're his. They're his wisdom, his insight. They're the things that liberated him. And they, will help, they can help us liberate ourselves. But it's only through this direct knowing, this, uh, this uh, as I said, right effort or skillful effort of bringing up the knowing instead of all the thinking and the doing. So this is a very, very important part of right effort or skillful effort. And of course, you know, one of the main things with our effort, and you see this in, in daily life particularly, that the important thing is where we're coming from, isn't it? Where we're coming from. And of course the Buddha said, First thing is, you know, right effort should come from an understanding of right, right view. This is view that leads to liberation. And that particularly, what that particularly means is that we have an understanding that what we do and say will have consequences. What we think will have consequences. And those consequences are of a similar nature to the way we're doing, speaking and thinking. So if we're acting negatively, we'll get uh, negative results and so on. And people may think this is very basic. They may think, you know, wow, this is kindergarten stuff. But in actual fact, it's crucial to keep that in mind that there are consequences because then however we act, however we use our effort, will be in accord with that understanding, yep, I'm going to get some results from this. <laughs> so it's very important to have keep that in mind. But even, uh, I think even more important is how we where we're coming from, how we make effort, is very, this is a crucial in our life. And this is not only for the path to enlightenment, this is actually for all our life, whether it's you know, study, whether it's work, making effort at work, in the home, wherever, is where we're coming from is actually more, is more crucial than the, uh, in terms of karma too, in terms of happiness. So if we, if we are coming from a sense of trying to get and gain, you know, compete perhaps, or we're coming from a sense of ill will, anger, irritation, annoyance, or just coming from an incredible sense of self, then that sort of effort, where will that lead? <laughs> it will probably, you may get what you want in the term, in short term, people can with a lot of, you know, you see a lot of ego uh, uh, driving effort in, in particularly in politics and other, other fields. So you can see the results from that. They usually, maybe they, they get the immediate goal, but in the end, they create usually a lot of negativity and a lot more problems for themselves and other people. So the very important thing is where we're coming from is from right uh, attitude or right motivation is vital. And of course, this is in the Buddhist sense, is in the terms of the Noble Eightfold Path, is coming coming from the sense of not getting and gaining, coming from the sense of giving up, giving to others, uh, dana we sometimes call it, and also coming from, we say, non ill will. This is any non-negative mind state, but it's really epitomized, isn't it, by loving kindness. So this is concern for other people's well-being, our own and others, and uh, uh, a very positive well-wishing for their happiness and well-being. And of course, the third one is non-harming. This is the third one is non-harming through our body speech or even through our minds. And this leads, this is more actively, more, um, uh, more easily understood. It includes compassion. So this is a concern for others' well, others' well-beings, uh, knowing that we don't wish to suffer and similarly others don't wish to suffer. And in any way we can help. We, to alleviate that, we will do our best. 
So effort that is coming from these three things, there's probably, it covers pretty much everything. If you say, you know, uh, not gaining and getting, if you say uh, non-ill will, non-harming, it covers uh, most of the negative emotions that, uh, uh, that we experience. But if you're coming from these emotions, these positive emotions, the results here and now are pleasant. <laughs> One feels quite good about it. And others will appreciate it, may appreciate it, not always. But in the end, the result will be quite good. With, of course, with all our actions, you know, we can only uh, be responsible for our intention. So if we do something, we say something good, and the other person doesn't appreciate it, no matter, no matter. We were coming from a good heart. We were coming from a good place, a good intention. That's all we can do. We can't control others and how they will react. And that's, that's quite, that's as it is. And that's a part of life. So this, um, this right effort or this skillful effort has to come from that sense of, you know, of a positive place coming from these, from these uh, positive qualities. I'm not getting, not gaining. Um, and not uh, and non ill will, loving kindness and compassion it is very important. And one of the famous stories I think everybody here, uh, many people here, not everybody, <laughs> will know. What's the most famous story about effort and energy? Mm. I mentioned it yesterday too. For those that were here yesterday, this is <laughs> a bit of a rerun of yesterday, actually, <laughs> but a little different. So, yes, the, there's a famous uh, disciple of the Buddha's was uh, Venerable Sona, and he's uh, Koli Visa. They usually have the names, uh, these extra names, because there are a number of Sonas, actually. And he was famous because, very interesting, he came from an extremely wealthy family, I think, in Savati, where the Buddha spent most of his time, actually, during his life. I think 23 reigns retreats, they say. And uh, this Sona, he was from a very wealthy family, and they, they say it was so wealthy that... Uh, you know, they would carry him everywhere. He would hardly walk anywhere. And it says, this is amazing, I've never heard of this, you may have heard of it. He even had this light hair on the feet, the soles of the feet, down on the soles of the feet. Presumably because he was not walking much. <laughs> not good for health. <laughs> anyway, he was, uh, so he lived a very pampered, very wealthy, indulged life. And then he became a monk, he met the Buddha, and they use classic ways you, uh, that uh, people become monks as they meet the Buddha, they listen to the teachings, they get inspired, and then they want to ordain. And so he went from a life of luxury, not unlike the, the Buddha in many ways, before he became enlightened, to living quite a simple life, a very basic life, uh, no luxuries. And But he has so inspired, he had so much energy from uh, meeting the Buddha, listening to his teachings, that... He used to exert his effort an incredible amount. He would walk meditation for hours and hours and hours. And they say that his feet would often be bleeding, they'd be bloody and it'd be painful. And, uh, but he kept up this practice of walking and, and striving as much as he could because he, he really took the Buddha's message to heart and it really, it really inspired him. But he reached the end of his tether. <laughs> His feet were a terrible mess, which is not surprising, given his, his, his previous family life. And so he thought, oh, it's too much for me, I can't do this. And then he thought, I will give up the holy life. I will give up the life of being a monk. And I will go revert to being a lay person. I will go back to the family life. And my family is very wealthy, therefore I can do a lot of good. I can make a lot of merit, a lot of punya a lot of pin, they say in Sri Lanka, um, from doing good. And the story says that the Buddha realized what he was thinking, because the Buddha had psychic powers in, in abundance. He never, he never showed them a great deal, actually. He was very against that idea of, you know, flashing around your psychic powers. But he, he realized what the Sona was thinking, and he came to him, and he said to Sona, he must, Sona must have been a bit amazed, actually, were you thinking? that uh, you could not bear up with the, with the holy life, it was too much for you, and that you were thinking of uh, disrobing and going back to the family life and uh, making merit through, uh, through your wealth, your family wealth. He said, yes, I was. <laughs> 
And so Sona must have been a bit amazed at the fact that the Buddha um, uh, could read his mind. And he said to Sona, Sona, the way you should develop effort, and no, he said for, to him, it was quite interesting, it must have taken him by surprise actually, he said, did you ever play the lute when you were, uh, lived in the home life? Which is a very good opening line actually, I'm sure Sona was probably thinking, what is he talking about? <laughs> Got his attention anyway. <laughs> And so, of course, uh, Sona coming from a wealthy family and well-educated, no doubt, in, in terms of that, what they learnt in those days, said, yes, of course, I, I, I learnt the lute. In fact, I was uh, you know, very good at it, which the Buddha may have known already, actually, which is why I asked him. And he said to Sona, well, what happens when you know, the strings of the lute are very tight? You know, they're adjusted very tight. Does it uh, sound good? And um, you know, is it easy to play like that? And Sona said, no, 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 it's very difficult, actually. It doesn't sound terrible. And then the Buddha said, well, what happens, uh, you know, when the strings are uh, very loose? Um, does that sound good? And um, is it easy to play? Said, no, no, it's, it's, it sounds even worse. <laughs> and so the Buddha said, ah, I said, Sona, just like the lute, you know, you should uh, have effort that is balanced between being not too tight and not too loose so that you can stay with the object, you can go beyond restlessness and dullness, go between the two extremes, be in the middle and then one will be, he'll be able to meditate, to, to as it were, uh, focus on the object, stay with the object. And so this is very, very important uh, aspect of effort, that it be balanced, it not be too much and it not be too little. This is for awakening, this is for becoming enlightened. But it's also very useful in daily life too. Sometimes uh, we can put too much effort into things and get too tight with them. And when we do, when we're like that, actually, it's like Venerable Sonia, we're missing the goal. We're missing why we're doing it, aren't we? We're often so focused on the effort, we forget what we're doing it for. And usually it's for, we want success, we want happiness, we want peace and achievement. So that sort of effort that's balanced, even in daily life, is very important because effort that isn't balanced is not sustainable. You, can't, you cannot put in maximum effort hour after hour, day after day. Uh, it's not possible. It's too much. It's draining. It'll make one tired. And in the same way too, if one's very sleepy and drowsy, the effort that comes from that is non-effort really. <laughs> One won't achieve anything either from that, that state as well. But what is sustainable is effort that is just balanced, that's just right. And in this context too, you see it in meditation sometimes people, they put in what we say a lot of effort, but whether it's right effort I'd have very much doubt because they, they're striving so much from a sense of getting, gaining, oh, I'm, one, I'm going to become, I'm going to become uh, concentrated they'll say, you know. Uh, I'm going to attain various knowledges and so on. And when it's coming from that, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort. And what people find, you actually have, I have seen it with meditators, that they can get tense with it, with that sort of over-efforting. This is another term one of my teachers uses, over-efforting, instead of having this balanced effort. And, uh, and I know one of the teachers from... Uh, 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 Burma, actually, Myanmar, is, uh, he's been here, Saidu Utejaniya. He calls this over-efforting in meditation, putting in too much effort. It's not sustainable and it leads to tension, it doesn't lead to relaxation. When we're not, re when we're not relaxed, it's very hard to take anything in, actually, <laughs> and, and to really attain any sense of stability and peace in the mind. It's very, very difficult. So he says the effort that we, we uh, need is this balanced effort it's just to know. And, he, you know, he always gives examples, you know, of, you know, you can just rub your fingers together. Is there a lot of effort in knowing that the fingers are rubbing together, feeling that contact? Of course there isn't. If the effort if is just to know, as Ajahn Brahm would say, then that's, that doesn't take a lot of energy, actually, to do it. And that's sustainable. And the reason he teaches that, of course, is that <laughs> he's talking about 24-7 practice you know, keeping the mindfulness, keeping this awareness going throughout the day, whenever when we're awake, when we go, before we go to sleep, keeping it going because then we develop this continuous mindfulness that can be really open to what we're experiencing 
And then we've got the data, then we've got the information for insight, real insight, deep insight. So it's very important that we balance these, these, this effort particularly. Sometimes they talk about uh, balancing the spiritual faculties. You probably know these five spiritual faculties of faith, energy, uh, mindfulness, and uh, stillness or samadhi, and also wisdom, balancing those. And sometimes they talk about balancing faith with wisdom because um, you, you do see it actually there are a lot of there are people with faith but not much wisdom in forming that faith and that can lead to superstition and uh, not really grasping the teachings not going to the meaning and uh, also the the more common one and it ties up with this one is having energy virya and uh, balancing that with samadhi because samadhi the stillness brings calms the mind down it, it means that the mind can come together it can focus um, and it can lead to if if we are a little dull if there's some uh, negative uh, if there's dullness or tiredness in the mind it can lead to us uh, losing our, our, our uh, stillness actually and becoming quite dull so we need a balance between those things of energy and uh, as I say um, Samadhi or concentration. So, we haven't even really got to what are the four right efforts. I must admit, when I first came across this teaching, I think it was Ayakema I heard it from first. I think she called it the four, I think it was the four great endeavors, something like that she used to call it, or supreme endeavors. And I thought, what a fantastic teaching. This is so complete and so whole and so balanced. And uh, what they are is because it, it's just extraordinary. When you hear it, you think, "Wow, what sense that makes!" You know. And the first one is to avoid or prevent um, negative states that haven't arisen, negative states, unwholesome states that haven't arisen. And the second one, of course, is to let go, abandon, overcome negative states that are already in our minds, unwholesome states that are there. So that's the negative side. And then the positive side is to arouse. Uh, positive states of mind that aren't there at the moment. And then the second aspect of it is to maintain and perfect these positive states of mind. So they continue in the mind. They're not just there for a moment. It's good when we have meta for a moment, but if we can continue it, if we can develop it. And of course, that's, that's very much the secret to overcoming the negative, isn't it? If we develop positive states of mind, the negative doesn't have much opportunity. And the more continuous the positive states of mind are, the less opportunity the negative have. And very much, as I mentioned, the, the training, the Buddha's training, is a reconditioning of the mind. And when we recondition the mind, we're creating new habits, uh, new pathways in the mind. Uh, we have, from our previous conditioning, many pathways that are negative, unwholesome, they're like ruts in the mind, They're very easy to, to bring up. So you see some people, they've developed uh, you know, anger, irritation, annoyance quite a lot, and they can get into a rage quite easily you know, over small things because they've developed that. But we can also develop the positive, and when we develop the positive, it overcomes and reduces these negative qualities. So, for instance, a person has a lot of anger. The more they can develop metta in their life, loving kindness in their life, the more that becomes the natural condition of their mind, then the less opportunity this anger, irritation will have to come up. And the happier they will be. And not only themselves, but of course the people around them. Because living with ourselves, if we are very angry people, is not easy. So it's, uh, it's a very... Uh, a draining, burning sort of emotion, isn't it? Anger. And for people around us, of course, that's not an easy uh, emotion to live with either. And the Buddha even, he gave another incentive for it. He said, that angry people is a cause, a condition, if we have to develop anger a lot in our lives, for being ugly, for being unattractive, in this life even, <laughs> and in future lives. And certainly, I think one of, one of the good things to do, if one is very angry and upset, Look in the mirror is quite a good thing to do because you think, oh my God. <laughs> you know, we say, look like a yakka, <laughs> you know, like, look, look like a, de a demon. You know, you see the redness and <laughs> sort of, you know, this sort of quality. So we can, that's, that can be a good way actually to pull us up, just, <laughs> just looking in the mirror. So those are the four right efforts that the Buddha 
was talking about. And I think in our lives we can, we can go towards these, you know, avoiding or preventing negative qualities from arising, and letting go of, finding ways to let go of, abandon, overcome those negative qualities that have arisen, and then developing positive qualities that have yet we haven't, uh, are not, we're not experiencing at that particular moment, and then to develop those positive qualities, maintain them and perfect them. And the important thing with the, this, is, this will bring home the, uh, the sense of effort that goes with it too, the refrain for each of these that the Buddha gives, and these are really powerful ones, he makes an effort, stirs up his or her energy, exerts his or her mind and strives. So this is very, you know, it's a very poor, you know, uh, energetic feeling to that. But of course, as I'm um, as I mentioned, the, the effort is a mental effort. It's not this sort of physical effort. It's this effort that's not coming from a sense of self, too. This is the, the problem with a lot of effort, actually. Often we can grasp it from a sense of, I'm going to do this. <laughs> I'm going to get this. I'm going to, you know, make this happen or stop this or whatever. And that sense of ego is a very... Uh, in, in a spiritual sense, is a very um, uh, negative way to develop effort. Can be done, willpower can be done, and you can see people who are very good at it, you know, in lay life, in, in uh, daily life, they, uh, they can be very good at developing energy from a sense of self, but it's not very pleasant for people around them, because it's usually at the cost of others. What I want is completely ignoring what's good for others, <laughs> what may be even good for oneself, actually, emotionally. So coming from this sense of self is uh, often, uh, well, it is always with effort, uh, difficult. And in spiritual terms, it's, a, it's, it's something that corrupts that, that effort, corrupts where we're coming from. And there's a very nice story of Nasruddin, actually, and I think I've told this, some of you will know it. One, Nasruddin was this Sufi teacher uh, who, is, who lived in, I think, Turkey a long, long time ago. And one evening, Nazaruddin was upstairs and his wife was downstairs. And his wife heard this almighty crash upstairs. And she yelled out to Nazaruddin, Are you all right? What's happened? And he said, Yes, I'm all right. And she said, What, was, what, was, what caused the crash? What caused that loud? Ah, he said, My cloak fell on the ground, fell on the floor. And she said, Your cloak? He said, Ah, I was in it at the time. <laughs> And when we're in it, when I is in it, of course, that's when we really crash. That's when we really experience the, experience the rough, rough side of life. So any sense of effort that's coming from I, me, and mind, it may work in, uh, in everyday life, business life. You see quite a lot, a lot of it in politics. You see quite a lot of it too. It may achieve the, uh, the initial goal, but there will be the crash that comes with it, actually, and some, usually unwholesome, because it's got no regard for anybody else. And really, the sense of I, me, and mine has no regard for our real, real welfare either, which is to be happy, to find peace, to find a meaning in life. So I will go into a little bit of detail just briefly about how we avoid the various factors and how we can develop them. You know, how do we avoid or prevent uh, negative states of mind from arising. It sounds, sounds a bit impossible, doesn't it, in a way? But a, a very good way uh, is, of course, if we know ourselves, that's a very good way. We know where our weak points are. We know what things, what buttons, when pressed, will, will, will get us going in a negative direction. And uh, in a very real sense, if we know ourselves well, we can avoid some of these situations, some of the... Uh, the opportunities for these buttons to be pressed. So that knowing ourselves is a very important way, actually, of um, avoiding uh, negative states of mind. And of course, uh, there's also very important is to know the, the negative aspects that come up in the mind. We call them the five hindrances for meditation. And there was a, a monk I know who, who did a very nice talk called Know Thy Enemies. Of course, it's a, like from the Bible, isn't it? I think it's from the Bible, it sounds like. It. Know thy enemies. And that's actually a very important way to avoid things. Because if you recognize uh, states of minds as enemies, as not something that's beneficial to me, 
then it's much easier to avoid them. You've got them in your mind. The programming of the mind also it takes it in. It says, aha, uh -huh, these are negative things. I'm not going to buy into them. So, of course, the big ones are sensual desire. And this, uh, this is uh, difficult in, in meditation, in life. It causes a lot of problems, gaining the sensual desire. Sensual desire is based on the five senses of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching. And even though most people find this hard to believe, I did too, that's our experience of life with thinking as well. The mind is usually regarded as the sixth sense. It's incredible, isn't it? When you listen to the Buddha's teaching, think, I first heard that and I thought, that can't be everything. I thought, no, well, there's nothing else you can have, actually. <laughs> that's, that's our experience, sum total, the five senses and thinking, and that's it. I thought, wow, that's too simple. <laughs> and, of course, the other negative qualities that are easy to keep in mind, to avoid, much easier, actually, are ill will, anger, uh, irritation and all those, either towards ourselves or others or situations in life. And dullness and drowsiness, they are things that we, we, in meditation, we try to avoid. We want to bring up energy. Um, in the mind and restlessness and worry. I think restlessness is a very common factor in daily life these days. We see it. I see people glued to the smartphone <laughs> and it's usually because of restlessness. They want something to entertain them. They're looking for some form of happiness and they move from one thing to another. YouTube to browsing to surfing here and there. And of course that's uh, restlessness and worry and then doubt as well is, uh, is the chronic uh, indecisiveness, you know, not being able to commit to things, not being able to commit because we have doubt in them. Either, uh, you know, often we say classically in the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha that, or the teachings or the meditation. Classically, actually very easily for us to see is often people when they first learn meditation, they have this doubt, am I doing it right? <laughs> and this really wrecks the meditation because you just think, oh, am I doing it right? So I always say to people when they're meditating, you can't do this wrong. <laughs> You'll get something out of it, you know. So if you can uh, drop this doubting about that. And of course, the biggest area, I think, for, I see it in the West particularly, is doubt in ourselves. Yeah, that's the main one. That's pretty disabling, actually. If, if we don't think we can do something, it's very likely we won't be able to do it. <laughs> so it's self-fulfilling. But one of the biggest, uh, the teachings that the, the Buddha mentioned in about avoiding and preventing is the nature of our experience of reality, which is the five senses and thinking. Because the way uh, experience works is that we have uh, the sense organs, eyes, ears and so forth, and then we have uh, the, the actual objects, you know, sight, smells, tastes, touches, that sort of thing. And we have the consciousness. When they come together, we get contact. This is where we, we're aware of it. We become aware of it. And then the Buddha said from that, we get a feeling, either pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, neither unpleasant or pleasant, usually arising from, I think, from past conditioning, actually, of what we consider to be pleasant, unpleasant. Uh, and then from that we have a reaction, and that reaction classically is called craving, but it can be called wanting, uh, desire, either to get or to get rid of, actually, is very strong. Both of them, actually, very strong. And so our, all our experience, actually, of... Um, it, moment by moment is like this actually if if something if we if we see something we like then there's a pleasant feeling then there's a feeling of wanting to get it wanting this is craving this is uh, wanting and then clinging to it. if we think this is going to be very good for our happiness we'll cling to it if it's something that we consider that uh, we have contact and then there's an unpleasant feeling if we think the object's unattractive then we get this unpleasant feeling, and then we reject it. We want to get rid of it. <laughs> we don't. We, we cling to that idea of getting rid of it as well. And this is a nature. It's very good if you're a meditator. You know, and particularly I saw this in uh, Burma, in Myanmar, in uh, with Saido Utajini's center. In meditation, you can see how much, moment by moment, we're really filtering everything we we experience. Uh, either liking it or disliking it. There is a third possibility, that it's sort of neutral, and we ignore that, generally speaking, we're not interested. But so much of our experience, moment to moment, is about liking and disliking. And these are, this is basically unwholesome in a way. So when we, when we realize that this is what we're experiencing, 
You may, you may not think this, actually. You might think, I don't know about you, but I'm not like this. <laughs> but we're actually, when you, when, you do, when you practice meditation, you see it much easier. That the moment by moment we are like this, liking and disliking. It's sort of a filter that we have on life. And uh, so the, the Buddha, was his advice to, um, to dealing with this situation is called sense restraint. So to be very careful about how not, uh, as it were, grabbing on to experiences, not holding on to them, either because we like them or dislike them, and not because if uh, not arousing an unwholesome uh, reaction uh, to our experience. But of course, you know, sense sense restraint means to me very much. Sense restraint comes from the sense of realizing that our happiness is actually from within. Our contentment, our satisfaction is within. And very often uh, the motivation for experiencing sight, smells, tastes and touches is I'm going to get happiness from this sight. Whether it's a beautiful person or, or what, somehow we try to grab it and think this is going to give us happiness. But actually the happiness comes from within inside. And if one has that sense of contentment in, in oneself, one's less likely to try and grab it from experience, sight, sounds, smells, tastes and touches. Of course, you know, I say to people, and the Buddha said this too, all these things are a form of happiness, but they're very temporary forms of happiness. They're very fleeting. They have to be. For any of them, any of these sense contacts, if they last too long, they become unpleasant. Your favourite piece of music for 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever, days on, days on end, will become a torture. And it's the nature of sense contacts. And it's also pointing to the fact where, where is happiness really lie? And of course that's inside each and every one of us. That's where it comes from. And uh, very much sense restraint is built on the idea of we are very selective about what we feed the mind. You know, are we feeding it health food or junk food? <laughs> There's a lot of junk food out there, actually. <laughs> and usually, you, you know, uh, the nature of junk food is to be tasty. <laughs> and therefore, people really like it. And a lot of the junk food, of course, is, is through our experience, of, you know, of internet, television, newspapers, and so on. And we have to, each and every one of us has to see what the results of, of this input is. You know, when I read the news, is it uh, leading to depression, anger, irritation, or not? You know, you just see our reactions to things. And then choose whether we continue to do that activity or not. Sometimes, you know, people, they talk about depression being, uh, you know, major, uh, the major uh, uh, mental illness of our time, actually. And I do wonder sometimes whether it's part of it is because people you know, they, uh, well, part of it's probably because of expectations of what life has to offer, what life should offer. Often it's a should, isn't it? It should be like this. But also part of it, I think, is, you know, uh, taking on a lot of the, you know, say, for instance, reading news a lot, watching news a lot, and coming from a sense of depression, negativity that we see in the world. And I, I realised the other day, new, often, not always, news, news uh, uh, papers or the internet, news media in general, is focusing on what Ajahn Brahman called the two bad bricks. <laughs> You've heard the two bad bricks story, you know, that he was building a wall at the monastery and then uh, he, he had finished one day and he noticed, because when they first started at the monastery in Western Australia, they didn't have money. And they couldn't hire builders. They they have more. They have uh, bricklayers these days, quite often. And he was building this toilet block. Was the first building they required actually. And he was building it. And he, was, he never laid bricks in his life. He's very clever though. I mean, he learned very quickly. And uh, he'd been laying these bricks. And then he noticed uh, after one day he finished the work. He stood back. Oh, two bricks were completely out of kilter. <laughs> And he thought, oh my God, he was really upset by it. And so he, he, uh, he, he asked the, uh, the senior monk if they could knock the wall down and start again. And he said, well, we don't have any money for that, actually. We don't, we've got, we don't have much money at all for, for rebuilding. So he said, no, you can't do it. And he said, you know, he would go on for days. He was thinking of ways he could get rid of this wall, blow it up or, <laughs> or whatever. And then someone said to him, came to the monastery, and uh, they were looking around, they were looking at the new buildings. 
the new building. And I always said, oh, isn't that good? It looks really good, very nice work and everything. And Ajahn Brahm is supposed to have said to this person, are you blind? <laughs> Can't you see? There are these two bad bricks here, you know, they're completely out of alignment. And he said, and the person said, must be a, a real bodhisattva, I think, or a real, a real saint. They said, ah, but I can see the 998 bricks that are good. <laughs> so, he, so this is very much our focus in life. We focus on the two bad bricks and we blow them out, in, out of proportion, as it were. It's interesting now, Ajahn Brahm, after that too, I think maybe following on from that teaching, he would say, these two bad bricks, actually a feature. <laughs> He said, that's what happens when people are building houses and there are mistakes. He says, ah, the builder can say, ah, they're features. <laughs> so, but newspapers are built on a new, a news. You can't say newspapers. It's a bit old hat now. News is much bigger, bigger umbrella term. And uh, are built on looking at the two bad bricks in life. Because you think, you know, you hear about all these terrorists and so on. But what about the 998 people that aren't terrorists? <laughs> or aren't in gangs or whatever. And most people aren't. And, uh, but the two bad bricks, they're in the news. They stand out pretty strongly. And sometimes their actions are pretty, pretty horrendous. But we should have a sense of balance, as I say. And therefore, you know, select the sort of food we're eating. Is it junk food? Is it leading to negative states of mind, emotions? Or is it leading to positive states of mind and, and enabling us, enabling effort? Because very much, you know, the effort can come from a sense of energy, but energy also comes from a happier state of mind than, I'd say, a depressed state of mind, not much energy, not much energy. So, and of course, mindfulness is also very useful um, in preventing or avoiding negative states of mind coming up. And I'll just mention a few things briefly to finish off. Of course, you know, associating with, I say, spiritual friends, like coming to a Buddhist center or any spiritual group, that is very useful for avoiding negative states. What you did earlier, uh, just earlier, taking the precepts, that avoids uh, a lot of negative states, can avoid. It just keeps in mind, doesn't it? When we take the precepts, it keeps in mind these areas I'm not going to go to if, if at all possible. And the other thing, this is very important too, um, in terms of having spiritual friends, that, that's a positive, you know, like-minded people, you're going in the same way, shared values, um, and in a Buddhist sense, going towards enlightenment, going towards uh, positive states. But also at the same time, uh, Buddha recommended not associating with foolish people and unmindful people. And that, that can be... Of course, you know, sort of companions like that can encourage us uh, in a negative way to, to uh, do things that are not for our happiness and well-being, say things that are not for our happiness and well-being. Maybe, uh, <laughs> so this is, this is quite important. I always say to people, when we talk about foolish people it's, and with unmindful people, it's good to remember we're like that sometimes. We're foolish. We're unmindful. So it's not, it's not really just pointing the fig, finger at other people. We've got to keep it in mind for ourselves. And the second one, to abandon or overcome arisen states of um, arisen uh, state, unwholesome states, of course, you know, is, 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 as I say, choosing to cultivate the positive and, and not to develop the negative. The Buddha gave a very nice teaching in the two kinds of thoughts, uh, which he divided into thoughts of sensuality, um, thoughts of anger, ill will, thoughts of harming, and the opposite were thoughts of giving up, giving, sharing, thoughts of non-ill uh, will, like metta, loving kindness, and thoughts of compassion, helping, non-harming. And we have the choice to what we develop. And this is a very important aspect to, to uh, giving up uh, negative, negative things in, in our experience. First thing uh, that's very important, I think we can do this in daily life, we do it in meditation, is just when we're aware, when we notice some a negative quality in the mind, in meditation you often see, sometimes it's like, it goes. It's just like you turn the spotlight on it and it vanishes like a thief you know sometimes well not all thieves will <laughs> but sometimes if you shine the light on they'll head off 
And of course, you know, the second level is a level of, that's the first level that can be quite useful actually in our daily life. Just and in meditation it does happen. That just paying attention can uh, actually um, abandon or let go of a negative state. And then very much the Buddha's advice to the, his son, Rahula, we can, we can reflect on that what, am I, what I'm doing or saying, is it harming me? Is it uh, harming me or is it benefiting me? Just to ask ourselves that is very useful. And uh, once we keep that in mind, it's very easy. It's easier to let go of things. And then also to ask, is this a positive thing or a negative thing I'm doing or saying or even thinking? And lastly, do, what after it's happened, whether what you've said or done or thought, see the consequences. Was it a painful result or was it a pleasant result? And that very much can... Uh, um, help us let go of doing those things or saying those things in the future. And a very, uh, very useful thing too is in reflecting on the fact that things don't last. We don't last, our bodies won't last, nothing lasts in this world. And so that can sometimes uh, enable us to let go of negative states. You know, particularly if there's a lot of, a lot of greed. If you go to the shop and you see, or the... Um, the uh, you know, shop to the shopping centre. That's better. And you see something you really like. There's a lot of uh, a, a lot of desire for this new laptop or new tablet or whatever. And then if you bring up impermanence to mind the fact that in maybe even in a month or two, certainly in a year, it will be it will be aging. It will be breaking down. It may have already broken down actually. And the fact that in three years you it'll probably be out of date completely if it's still working. So it's very helpful to remember impermanence in life and that way we can let go of things much easier because then we, we're in accord with reality that things are of the nature to break down. And when we realise that, the mind can let go much easier. And this is how the deep insights start actually because when we realise that things don't last, we can't hold on to them, they won't be here, they're not there. They're not the source of happiness that we thought they were. The mind will just turn away from it of itself. It's not me or myself or I who's doing that. The mind realised. The penny has dropped. So that's very good. And uh, one of the very um, uh, uh, nice pieces of advice I came ahead was for, and it's a very useful formula for life. Where it's very similar to the formula for what we had on New Year's Eve, AFL. Accept, forgive, and let, uh, learn, I think we had to learn. But Ayakima had one, recognition, no blame, and change. So we recognize what has happened, what situation, what the situation was like. We don't blame ourselves, and we don't blame others, and then we can change, and then change, move on. So that's a very useful way to uh, abandon uh, negative things that have arisen. And I could go on a good deal more <laughs> about the, the Buddha's advice for how to abandon uh, negative thinking in meditation. But I think that's probably enough to just to say, you know, to encourage all of us to develop right effort, skillful effort. And as I say, skillful effort immediately points to the fact, where am I coming from? You know, is this for my happiness and well-being or, and for others' happiness and well-being? And if it is, that's, that's skillful. But if it isn't, it's going to lead to uh, problems for ourselves and for others. And, but it's very important that we have this right effort uh, in order to develop the Noble Eightfold Path, to develop spiritually. We need effort in our lives. And we need effort in our workplace at home. And if it can be a skillful effort at home and in the workplace, even better. Because, as I say, you know, people don't make much negative karma sitting on a cushion, probably coming to a Buddha center, very little negative karma. But at home and at work, that's, that's another story. So we have to really work on those two environments, actually. Because while you're here, you're pretty good. <laughs> but once we, once we go home or once we go to work, that's another story. It can be... A, can, and that's actually where most of, you say, the collateral damage, the damage is done, the negative karma is accumulated. But in a positive sense, it's also where we can practice. 
because as I say, you know, uh, meditation, taking the precepts, all these sorts of trainings are like preparation for our lives, our whole life. And our whole life is family life, working, everything. It's a 24-7 practice that way. So really when we're here, we're, we're practicing, we're getting ready for the match. <laughs> Certainly when we leave here, we're, we're involved, we're in the match as it were, and at home and at work. So it's very much how we play the game is very important. Often people mention this, don't they? Say, if you play the game in the right spirit, that's very important. So I hope that was useful about uh, right effort, samawayama, or skillful effort, and that you can put it into practice. Because it's all very nice to hear, nice uh, ideas, concepts, and so forth. But the important thing is to actually use them, for them to be practical. So I wish you well for that.